What's happening, party people? Riot started TV is in the building. Act like you know. Tell a friend to tell a friend till it's till it ends. You know what I'm saying? We are here. Um, it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day to be alive on the planet. It's a beautiful day to be on the right side of the barricades. You know, so um, I just want to say shout out and salute to all the warriors. Stay ready for revolution because it's serious out here right now just as it's always been, but we're going to take it to another level. I want to start off by saying my name is Kalanji Jamachanga. Uh, I represent the FTP movement. I appear courtesy of my organization, FTP Movement. Um, I am one of the, uh, the folks who run this BPM, this Black Power Media uh, program. And of course, uh, I host Riot Starter TV, which is what you're watching right now. Uh, before we get started, I want to just point out that um, we have, you know, in regards to our program, FTP movement, in regards to organization, we have a platform, a program called Liberation Housing. And what Liberation Housing is about, it is a situation where we're looking to take care of our OGs because oftentimes our OGs, which we call original guerrillas, uh, they put in so much work. Many of them are, are jailed and imprisoned and, um, you know, they become ill and so on and so forth. And they get out the joint without you know, a place to, place to go, a place to be, you know, and oftentimes they're trotted around the country and, you know, you get the interviews and you get to him speaking all that, but then when the lights go off, you know, no one's concerned. So one of the initiatives, the initiatives that we've uh, put forth is Liberation Housing. Uh, you can find out more about that at the website that you see on the screen right now, the natural uh, festival.com slash liberation housing. Now, without further ado, uh, today happens to be the 54 year uh, commemoration of the assassination of, you know, one of our greatest. And I, I say that because oftentimes the brother gets a bad rap because of his quote unquote nonviolent stance. But we're going to get into all that. But today happens to be the 54 year commemoration of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Now, we're careful with our terms. We say commemoration. We're not saying anniversary because of the fact that we're not celebrating. Oftentimes we get accustomed to celebrate, celebrating um, when we are gunned down, when we are attacked, murdered, so on and so forth. Those are pieces that we commemorate because we understand that uh, that this fight and this struggle, it is protracted and it's ongoing. So it's not a loss. It's a victory. We celebrate. Excuse me. It's it's. Uh, a commemoration is not about just a quote unquote victory. It's about us um, acknowledging what is what has been put forth. Um, so I wanted to point that out. So today what I wanted to do, I said, man, I need to get someone on here who can give a concrete analysis of not only Dr. King, but who he was and why it was important for him to be um, cut down, gunned down on that fateful day of April 4th, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. So I said, who better to reach out to than one of our greatest, one of our living legends, who happens to be a professor, a student of Malcolm, and a, a I dare say a contributor to, to our movement and to our liberation struggle. I'm talking about none other than Professor James Small. Yes, Professor Small. Brother, it's an honor to be with you again, and 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 this is a day where we commemorate one of our great heroes. Yes, Even then, when I was young, you know, I was extremely to the nationalist position, and really opposed. Even though I grew up in the South, came out of the South, got involved in the movement in the South in the cities and stuff. When I was fourteen, I still didn't ally myself with nonviolence because. We came out of a violent situation in the South. That's right. And and we didn't always respond nonviolently. I mean, the Deacon for Defense is an organization that people keep in the shadow, but they existed to defend Dr. King and others and never stopped trying to defend him throughout their history. And there was other organizations uh, we saw coming with our brother out of uh, North Carolina and other parts Robert of Williams, right on. Uh, Robert Williams. And we, my, my 16th birthday was a 22 pump rifle because we knew where we lived. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Right. Um, my 17th birthday was a two set Derringer. This is coming from my grandma. Right on. <laughs> she understood where we live. And I lived in the rural area and had to move between the rural area and the city. And I mean, hitching a ride home 
with white folks, black whoever would give you a ride. Sometimes you'd have a good treatment ride. Sometimes you'd have a pretty dangerous one. So you had to always be armed. What part of the South what was that, brother? South Carolina, Georgetown, between Myrtle Beach and Charleston. Right on. Okay. South Carolina is still one of the most racist. They be put that on Mississippi, but you need to look at the record in South Carolina, one of the most racist states in the country in all categories. That's right. And most people forgot that's the first state to break away to form the Confederacy. That's right. That's right. And they haven't changed. And, and we just saw the senator attacking the sister for the Supreme Court the other day like any vicious dog would do. He hasn't right. changed one bit over the decades. That's right. So, so my, um, my mother's family comes up out of South Carolina um, and I lived in Greenville for a while myself. Okay. And under, under the- uh, what it's like. Now. Oh yeah, the, 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 the Strom Thurmond plantation. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Racist crackers like that, right. you know, so, so and yeah. Even, even though Doc led a movement where his tactics was civil disobedience, nonviolence, and, and 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 uh people missed the point that wasn't the southern black people's position right that was a tactical position that southern black people were involved with in fighting the system but we all had guns right and we did shoot back you know but the myth that white media has given us that we just stayed down there and cower and got beat up and said that's not true Right. There's a difference between living your daily life in, in a terrorist environment and carrying out some tactical political action to bring about some significant change. And that's what Dr. King was about. Um, right. He wasn't the first to, to use that tactic, but he was the one that had used it more effectively than anyone in our history. And, I'm glad. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that you know, and for one thing, shout out to uh, Mukasa Dada, formerly Willie Ricks, because one of the things. Yes, sir, brother Willie, how you doing, sir? Yes, sir. So he he, he told me uh, some years ago. He said, you know, because of course we know that uh, Snick had a relationship with the LCLC, SCLC, oh, yeah. Martin's organization. And one of the things he told me, he said, "You see that Bible that King walked around with?" He said, "It wasn't just for no scriptures." He said he had it carved out with a thirty-eight snub nose in it. Mm -hmm. You know, so so even with you know, like I said, the importance of the whole nonviolent strategy. I, I, I kind of want to touch on that because, like you said, um, so many people just look at it like, you know, and, and you, you hear like some of the youth saying that I am I am not my grandparents. This right. ain't my grandparents. And, and, and I tell them to look in the mirror. Yeah. Show me everything you've got that you consider to be advantages. Your grandparents bought it with their blood. Right? Man, listen, not only that. Most of them, I, I say, you, you're not your grandparents because you're a punk. Because mm -hmm. your grandparents are brave enough. To say. Yeah. Could you imagine? And I was in that situation a few times when we were getting ready to go to march. We knew we could die. Right. We had no arms. The few people who were assigned to have arms were strategic persons. Right. Right. The group didn't know who those persons were. The group decided that we're going to go face this monster. That's right. Not just the police, but the Klan, the White Citizens Council, when we marching down the street, it could come from anywhere. And so you get these young, and, and, and what most people don't understand, most of the people that followed Dr. King was under the age of 18. That's right. That's right. These were youngsters. Yes. I was one of them. I wasn't yes. with him, but I was with the ministers, Reverend George Besselu in my town and right. others. And so we, 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 we knew we might die, you know? But you stood in that church and you sang. You weren't praying helplessly. You right. were singing songs to build your spirit, to build your courage, you know? Right. When you sit there, before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my God and be free. And then the whole church go, oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, you built up a courage inside right. so that when you marched out there, you marched at this one force, right. a spiritual force. People may take that lightly, but don't take it lightly because we scared those crackers even with the guns in their hands and the sticks in their hands. They didn't know what's wrong with those crazy people. That's right. 
Don't they know we got guns and we can shoot them? Yes, and we still yes. keep coming. Yes, yes. They didn't understand the force right. that the black movement had. And it was a force where we, we, we really weren't faking the asking for justice. We were really demanding justice. Right. right. It wasn't a show. Yes. People yes. died. Right. And, and even, it, even not just the death, you worked in those factories and fields for those people and they see you or your children in the march, you got fired the next day and you couldn't feed your family. You got harassed in all kinds of other ways. You owed a bill at the store that said, we want the bill now, we're gonna come and take the refrigerator out your house, take right. the stove out your house because you hadn't paid for it because they saw your children in the march. Right. This and, went on every day. And that, that, that level of, of bravery, because again, you know, I, I think that most of the time when you hear folks talk, um, you know, talk crazy for lack of better words, as if, you know, everybody was just punctified, you know, they clearly haven't organized in the South. No. You understand what I'm saying? And I, I grit my teeth in organizing in, in the North, but, but moving to the South, going to places um, at night in Mississippi, in mm. Alabama, mm. in Georgia, where I live, in South Carolina, where I live, it is a certain degree of 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 treachery and 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 just uh, terror of just riding through these particular places. Let me tell you, one night we were trying to desegregate something called a pavilion. It's a very it was like what we call a mall today on Paulus Island, South Carolina. And where we were in the black community, that was called Parkersville. So mm -hmm. we had to cross a bridge, right? First night, we surprised them. And so they called in the state troopers and all the police and everything. And a couple of fights broke out, but nothing really bad. The second night, our numbers were larger. And we'd gone across the bridge and we were singing, brother. And all of a sudden, all of the lights on the island went black. Woo. All right? And then you just heard motorcycle and engines coming your way. Mm. And now you had to run. Because there's wow. no you're on a bridge. Right. You don't want to get caught on that bridge. And the what it feels like, that kind of fear that you have to take to challenge a system. And I was a youngster then. You know, I was right. think then I was like going on 17. Wow. And we were running back across that bridge so we can get across Highway 17 back into the pockets of those sections. Then we could take our stands right there because we home. We know you we at. Right. Down, we got family, we got friends. Right. But, but that 10 to 15 minutes it took to cross that bridge with them coming at us. Right. You know. We're, in the dark. That's, in that's, the dark, pitch yeah. black. They yeah. cut off all the lights. No street lights, no house light, no nothing. Right. And the car lights, you could see them coming from miles away. You know, mm. and so when they got to the boundaries, they know to stop. They know if we cross the boundaries, then black folks will shoot back. That's right. So they stopped at Highway 17. You know, I, I was just down in uh, Selma. I hosted um, part of this, uh, the commemoration they had down there for Bloody Sunday. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, in my mind, I had, I, I was like, I'm never going to Alabama. I'm never commemorating any of this quote unquote civil rights stuff because you know as, as you stated you know I've never been on the side of, of nonviolence. Right. In fact, you know, I, I was pro Malcolm with, you know, our religion teaches us to be peaceful, to be courteous, you know, obey the law. But if someone puts their hand on you, send them to the cemetery. So that's been our our school of thought. You know what I mean? we I'm cool with whatever you got to say. You know, just don't put your hands on me. We good. You know, but I was invited to uh host this piece out there. And to be a block away from the Edmund, Edmund Pettus Bridge and mm -hmm. to see the footage of what took place when you had men, women, and children. And, and the most important thing about what you what you just said was the majority of these folks were young folks. Yes. You know what I mean? So to be that brave, to stand up face to face, is one thing to talk shit on the internet, right. do a type by, and to talk about, you know, kill whitey after the police, all that, or even to be in a, in a quote unquote safe zones with your signs and all that. 
Mm -hmm. You down here with these southern redneck crackers uh, who 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 are used to owning you at war with you and will right. take your life on a dime without 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 question. Let me tell you another story. I'm 18. I'm on the football team, Howard High. We on the field practice, and if somebody come running screaming, Mr. Flagler, the only white supermarket in the black community, just off of Mammon Road in Georgetown, pull a gun on a brother over a loaf of bread. Wow. Well, 44 of us, I could still hear the cleats. You know, you had them big football cleats in those days as we run it down the asphalt, and we tore that supermarket up, ripped it up, nothing standing. He never was able to open again. He tried. But our parents came and sat at the church across the street and picketed it every day so he could never open and had to sell it to a black man who turned it into a funeral parlor. Mm. <laughs> you know, I just think of that. Right. Um, people don't think that we did that in the South, that we right. stood like that. When we were picketing the Strand, I think I guess that was about 16 then, the Strand and Palace Theater in downtown Georgetown, our parents. Remember, these are the people of Maury Science Temple. My grandpa was Maury Science Temple okay. and Prince Hall Freemason, Odd Fellas Knights of Pythias. Those men all belong to organizations that defended the black community, right? Right. right? We don't understand those organizations today, but we need to learn the history of them. And so they came one day and popping up and said, We don't want you begging to go into their theater. They made us stop. And every Wednesday night, in our church, they showed us the same movies. They were one white folks watching in the theaters. Hmm. And mama and them made popcorn on the store and in, in, in the back of the church. Uh, I mean, that's a level of consciousness people don't even understand because right. no one has really talked about it. They had a sense of dignity and pride about the struggle too. There's certain things they know they had to go against. We, we dealt with the, the voting issue. And Georgetown was a town that was fun, fairly integrated from the Second World War going forward. You know, by the time I'm 17, I joined the Naval Reserves. Mm -hmm. It was one of the only Naval Reserve Center in the South that was still integrated from 1945. And I would find out when I go to a Savannah, Georgia to college at 18, and I was assigned to that reserve center report for duty and did my little snap, see me to print a small foot of duty, sir. They said, nigga, what you doing here? Boy, you have no idea. <laughs> but I felt like in the dark at this door in this white neighborhood with a little white uniform on and the dude who I thought was my comrade in the military said, nigga, what you doing here? And slammed the door of the center in my face. Right, right, right. Reminded you of who you were, no matter Absolutely. how. No matter where you thought you was and, right. and who you thought you represented. And so you know, by the time the commanders came to the door and, and asked, they didn't say, come on in, sailor. They said, how did you get orders here? I said, well, I'm going to school down at Savannah State, which was just down the road, about a mile. Right. And I'm assigned here. And the rest is rudeness, nastiness, meanness. I finally, there was an incident and a shooting and stuff, and I had to leave town, leave school. That's another story. But wow. the point is to tell our people that we did not sit on our laurels in the South. We used different tactics in different places for different reasons. And Dr. King mastered a tactic that allowed him to go up against the system and minimize the action against his people that would have cost lives, mm -hmm. you know, in, a, in, a, in an environment where we were totally outnumbered with the guns and the law enforcement and the state troopers and we couldn't fight that physically right okay? we had to fight it spiritually and so nonviolence and passive resistance became the spiritual tool which was a massive tool because by 64 we're getting the voter rights act or the civil rights act and by 65 we got a voter right act we broke them and we won we made them change the constitution we made them restructure their government. You see? And, and we don't look at the fruits that came from that fighting that we take advantage of now. Two years later, we got the fair housing passed based on that nonviolent strategy of Dr. K. <laughs> but when he challenged them on using money that should be helping black, white, and Latino, and Asian poor, and dumping it in Vietnam to oppress another people, 
Well, the billionaires and the millionaires who make money off a of war, the military industrial complex and their uh, partners in government killed him. Make it plain, the CIA, the FBI are tools of corporate America. Right. But he challenged the war and challenged the financial basis of that war and the, depri the deprivation on the population in terms of poverty, housing, food, clothing, shelter for the poorest of the poor, that capital being used somewhere else to fight a war that was totally illegal because they never declared a war in Vietnam. That's right. They never declared war on Vietnam. So even that was a crime against his own laws. And Doc challenged them on that. So let, let's let's talk about that because I think that um you know you know for for the American Negro you know <laughs> that, that that will watch this say hold on what you mean you know uh 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 the government didn't kill Martin um you know uh little white boy what's his name um James Earl Ray poor James, James. Earl Ray yeah he, so, he got yeah. caught in the catch money too he 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 he, he was the uh, the patsy right yeah so so. I mean, let, let's go back a little bit. So we talk about King, who was, for all practical purposes, he never saw the age 40, him or Malcolm, 39 years old, both 39 years old. murdered. And and so many of our, our, our leaders didn't see 40. We're youngsters. Ago. People don't yes. realize these were young men and women. Making moves. Yes. You know, power yes. moves. You know, and, and working with, with other forces. Because, again, we talk about the nonviolent side of King, but we don't talk about the fact that, you know, he had younger comrades like the Stokely Carmichael's and, and, and the brothers and sisters from uh, SNCC and, right. and the Panthers and so on and so forth. Like, like you... there was one, one situation that was talked about Dr. King's greatest victory was in Albany, Georgia, hmm. but they don't say that Albany, Georgia had been organized by SNCC. Hmm. The SNCC was the one running the voters rights movement throughout the South. And, and in Albany, they had invited Doc then, but the Albany sheriff had gotten slick on them. They said, listen, the way Dr. King do this thing, he filled your jail, he filled your courts, you can't function, so you got to let everybody go and you got to give in. So yeah. the guy in Albany, he contacts all the surrounding county. So everybody I arrest, I'm sending to you. I'm not putting anybody in jail in Albany. Mm. <laughs> and so he forced, he almost broke the movement because Snick was trying to push it and then they had to bring Doc in. And, you know, they had to, there was always ideological difference between the youngers and the oldest and the more radical and less radical. But despite all of that, they still worked together to get these things done. And so after Albany, when it looked, when they didn't change the rules because they were able to send all the prisoners out that they were capturing in this battle, Dr. King was really sad and broken. Hmm. And then one day, the youngsters, you'll see the next footage of him when it's, it's concerned Albany, when he comes back, he's got all these high school kids. Because mama and daddy and them had to go to work. Right. Only the church leadership and a few people could, adults, you see marching up front, 90% of those people were teenagers. Right. But that force was powerful. Yes. yes. And it gave him the victory in Albany, Georgia, he needed to re-spark the movement. Um, and when we study this movement, because we, we're, not, we're not talking about marching for the fun of marching. We're right. saying, hey, we want the right to vote. We want the right to just register to vote without being terrorized, beaten, and killed, okay? We want to be able to have fair housing like everybody else in the community. And we want protection under law. It wasn't just about integrating lunch counters. They were the, that was the minimum of what the struggle was about. That was just symbolic of causing change where we could do it easily. The big change was citizens' enfranchisement of the Black population so that we can vote where we live, that we can elect our elected officials, all right? That you take my tax money and you build all kinds of facilities like libraries and other things, and I can't come in it? Right. You know, this is what the struggle is about. It's enfranchisement as a citizen of the United States. You know, now, and, and listen to this last thing, because people have myth and try to make myth history. There's nothing in the Constitution of the United States that says black folks weren't citizens. Nothing. 
they were violating the human rights of their own citizens when they were practicing the segregation supported by law against black people. And they're still doing it. I know, I know. So for folks who, you know, we, we talk about voting, you talk about electoral politics, and we often hear that uh, things like uh, our ancestors died for our right to vote. What does that mean when you hear that, you know, coming up in the South, uh, supporting, you know, our, our people's liberation movement as a whole? What does that mean when folks uh, simplify and say that I'm voting because our ancestors died for um, our right to vote? How do you how do you view that? What, what does that mean to you? Right. It means our, our people are not studying history and what the tools of history are. Right. The most fundamental thing in the life of any person or people is that they can provide food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for themselves and their family. That means you must control the economic politics and culture where you live. Malcolm called that black nationalism, but Dr. King also used those same words, that you must control the economic politics and the social where you live. Okay? They knew what they were fighting for. They were fighting for nationalism, whether they called it nationalism or not. And in order to control the economic politics and culture where you are, you got to be in control of land, labor, and resources where you are. In order to get those kinds of control, you must use the system you're involved in. And that means taking control of the voting complex that puts in power the people that make the rules that governs your local lives. And our people know that, that if we make the rules, if we get control of the land committee because we ran for those offices and elect ourselves we determine how land use takes place in this county okay if we get control by through election of the school board we can determine what the curricula is and how much money comes into our community for education if we get control of the city council we can determine whether the garbage truck will come in our community or pass our community by etc 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 and so you've got to understand politics, economic and culture. They're married. You can't separate them from one another. That's a triad. And you have to learn how to work that triad. And the way you work that triad is take the voting power that enfranchise that triad to give you the food, clothing, shelter, safety, opportunities. That's what affirmative action was about. It was about if I got the skills and I've got the tools and I got the education, you can't deny me access to employment based on your prejudice. Right. Because the law would say that's not a fair play. Okay. Right. And so that's why we were fighting, but we weren't asking anybody for nothing. We right. built this country when we didn't get any salaries and we couldn't go to college yet. We mastered all the skills necessary to build a whole new civilization in the wilderness of North America. Without a doubt. I'm glad that you pointed out uh, all the, um, the, the quote unquote, uh positions and offices that you named were local because of the fact that yes. as we know all politics are local so that, that was very Absolutely. important you, you wasn't you wasn't talking about you know so you'd be the first black president or the the, yeah. the, the first black uh uh head of the department of labor and all that type of stuff understanding that all politics are local and i think that that's one of the uh the uh the, the points that folks miss when we're and, talking and that's about why the students. resistance was so hard in the South. They understood that our numbers would give us significant local power. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And you had folks like Lowndes County uh, Freedom Fighters uh, down in uh, uh, Lowndes County, Alabama, mm -hmm. uh, with folks like uh, H. Rap Brown and, and, and Ed Brown and all of those. Um, but I, I wanted to, uh, you know, just just hopping back to to King. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say if if we were co to compare strengths and weaknesses? You know, I know that you were uh, you were part of uh, you were one of the, the students of El Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm yeah. X. I, I was in OAU and and I was the Imam after his assassination of the Muslim Singh. Right on, right on. So so it's clear what mm -hmm. side of the barricade you on. You weren't you know right. you weren't talking about we shall overcome. You know what I'm saying? You was, you but, was talking about moving things. In the, in the march against the war, when, when's that? Is that 67? Uh, yes, I believe so. 67, right before he was yeah. assassinated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because, so yeah. That, in New York. 
Okay. I was in I was in that marsh because I was Ella's bodyguard. One okay. of Ella's bodyguard. Ella was Malcolm X's sister. Right. And she sat on the stage down by the UN between Dr. Spock and Dr. King. Hmm. That's as close as I got to, to see and meet Dr. King. That's pretty close. Um, that's pretty close. <laughs> and um the brother who was my comrade, the head of security, was a brother named Willie Stock, also a South Carolina Geechee man. So uh, we 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 knew how to unite and lock around. Yes, um, right. But there wasn't as big a rift between our ideological space as most people would think or most historians have said. Because Dr. King and Ellis stayed in touch. They plotted together. Right. Well, like the day he was shot, we sent the team down to Memphis, mm. led by Sister McKinney, one of our sisters out of um, uh, Oakland. Okay, from the OAU, because we want to know what just happened to this man. You know, Dr. King had a deep respect for Malcolm. Malcolm had a deep respect for him. Dr. King and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad shared the same attorney, Brother Jones. So they were closer than people might think. Uh, right. Dr. King had multiple meetings with the messenger. You know, they didn't just talk about baseball and basketball when they right. got together. So, yes, you have... It was like Booker T. Washington. I love Booker T. Washington because people misunderstood him. You in Alabama, you can't do what I could do in New York. That's right. You have to play the Alabama hand. You understand? Damn sure better if you want to live. Right. And so when you begin to study these men and women and the organizations with Dr. King epitomized, who was leading a struggle in one of the most anti-Black, anti-African terrorist territory on this continent, you had to understand why their strategy became what it was. And then look at how successful the strategy was. We broke them. We ended the Confederacy. The Confederacy did not end at the end of the Civil War. They came back full force after Reconstruction and the betrayal of the Black community by Rutherford B. Hayes and the Northern businessmen. Right on. Threw us back on the plantation and back into slavery. You can call it Jim Crow if you wanted. It was the genocide of slavery continual. That's right. It wasn't until the civil rights movement that the Confederacy was defeated finally and broken. That's why they were running down in Washington on on the sixth, trying to get it back. But y'all ain't getting it back. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's right. That's right. We, we need to build on what we've won. But we need right. to study history and recognize we defeated and broke the Confederacy throughout the South based right. on the movement that was epitomized. There were many other leaders beside Dr. King, but he was the premier leader that the other leaders put in front of them. Right. Okay. And that young man and the way he articulated our struggle um, oratorically and having the courage to come and stand in the front of that march after everybody said, you're going to get killed. And he still marched on with his comrades and the young people of those communities and brought change, not just at the local level, not just at the state level, but at the national level that changed the trajectory of the entire country. Because we need to read that voters' right bill of 64 and the civil rights bill of 65 and the housing bill that came a year later. We need to understand that. And if you analyze it right, after the bill was passed and that concept they call affirmative action is a part of the bill, the next bill that gets passed in Congress is the biggest immigration bill in the history of America. Let me tell you why I put that in. Because somebody decided, well, if they can't work, they can't take care of their families and they have to find alternative means to survive and we got a prison system for them. Right. So we will bring in another labor force into the country and we will replace the black labor force. We don't talk about it because we don't want to look like we smacking one of our brothers who are brown or yellow, but like, hey, you smack me, I'm gonna smack your ass back, wake up and see what's going on because it's still going on. You want to replace me in the work marketplace and you don't, and you come from a terrorist environment that was created by this imperialist and you pretend you don't know what's happening to my population? You're right. satisfied to see me go to prison? No. I need food, clothing, shelter, safety for my family just like you do. Let's collaborate. Don't be a collaborator. 
this you and I collaborate, brothers and sisters from abroad, so we can fight. You're talking about a working class struggle. Let's have a real working class struggle, not just let the black folks do the struggling and everybody else come and say, oh, I'm working class too. That's right. That has to stop. Right. I'm not people of color. I'm an African American. America is a geopolitical place where I reside in Africa is my race. That is right. not a contradiction. Right, right. So I, I want to, I wanna, uh, because one of the things that you said earlier, you said that the, the government killed Martin, right? Of course, right. that no, no one's surprised at that. But I, I want to point out that exactly one year before, April 4th, um, 1967, at Riverside Church in New York, mm -hmm. um, Dr. King condemned the Vietnam War, and he identified the government as the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that it was uh, coincidence or timing that he made this announcement or that speech exactly one year before he was assassinated in Memphis? I think that when he made that speech at Riverside Church, that's when the decision was made that we've got to eliminate him from the space of leadership in the black community. Because at this point, he's no longer leadership in the black community. At this point, he's leadership in the world community. Right. And they feared that, you know, we've gotten the Nobel Peace Prize. He had been elevated to a level the whole world is now looking and, and saying like, what is this man saying? Did we miss something? We didn't know that this oppression was going on. We didn't know this kind of, uh, uh, you know, the same reason Malcolm got killed. Malcolm go to Europe and pull the cover off of the human rights violation in America. The, the genocidal terrorism throughout the southern part and even the northern part of America, who just did it with a cooler slide and embarrassed the American government before the whole world while America was fighting the Cold War, trying to persuade African and Asian new nation states to come with them. And Russia and China was trying to persuade them to come the other way. Malcolm stepped in the middle, but Dr. King did that right from his pulpit here in America. He pulled the cover off of a, the corporate how do you say, the, the corporate exploitation of a whole people. And that corporate exploitation was backed by government and law and the Supreme Court itself, going all the way back to the Dred Scott decision. See, when the court in the land is rationalizing slavery, the court in the land, your highest court is rationalizing uh, segregation the court in the land is justifying terrorism against a single population of your citizenry. Dr. King was exposed on all of this. And when the war issue came up, he was able to say, wait a minute, you're saying we're fighting, we need to fight against poverty. We need to fight against housing. We're trying to get a poverty bill passed, but we can't get it passed. Can't get a housing bill passed. Can't get a, a, a fair working bill passed, but you can put billions of dollars to kill other people in Vietnam, and sure. and 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 pretend you're fighting a war, uh, supposedly against communism, when the truth you're fighting over oil rights and you're fighting over the rights to, to destroy the one of the biggest rice producing nations in the world. See, people don't understand rice. Let me tell you something about rice. Right. <laughs> Everybody in the world eats rice. Right. Whoever controlled the rice crop have a trillion dollar industry. And guess who controls the rice crop now? Not Southeast Asia, America, because we use Agent Orange and other defoliant and poison the soil over there. Hmm. Okay. You go to Sacramento and Rogers, to Sacramento Valley, you see rice field after rice field. Sacramento and rice, nobody makes the equation. Right. That's wild. You know, I'm not talking about the oil that is off of the coast of Vietnam, which right. they knew about. And they want it. Didn't right. have nothing to do with ideology. Because North Vietnamese, Ho Chi Minh, reached out to us for help. Right. They said, we want to be like your Declaration of Independence. But we weren't about freedom fighting for Vietnam and the France was dominating them. We were about taking the wealth of the land away from the France so it could be exploited by American corporate structure, backed up by the American military. And that's what Doc was talking about. And they knew what he was talking about. While the poor people in America, white and black, and suffering, can't find work, the few that work it up in the mines and stuff is dying from black lung, and you ain't doing nothing about it. 
the people up in, 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 in the mountains of North Carolina, Virginia, and other places, the poor whites are in worse condition than the blacks in the ghettos of the Northeast. And Dr. King pointed it out right on. and said, the money that should be going towards helping a citizen, you're putting in the war and then sending their kids to die in a war that is totally unjust. Matter of fact, you never declared war in Vietnam ever. Hmm. I was in the military, it's time to go to Vietnam, and I refused to go. And I wasn't the only one. Don't make me a big deal. Many blacks and whites in the military refused to go and fight in Vietnam. I know. I know. And took the court martial and took the punishment. Uh, well, definitely, we we salute you for that service. You know what I'm saying? We salute you. I for... didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I know I wasn't gonna kill some innocent <laughs> people. Who didn't hey. like Malcolm said they didn't do nothing to me. By then, I'm I'm, I'm listening to Malcolm X in both ears, and I'm in the military. And we organize ourselves, we call ourselves the split brotherhood. Hmm. I don't know if that was there, what that word split means, but the brothers, for those who are still alive, who chose that, like Jimmy and the others, you know, right. we took our stance and right we fought. And so, but coming back to Dr. King, he was our spiritual leader, he was an intellectual leader, and he was a military leader. You don't go out in the streets up against the army of your enemy without being military. And the most strategic part of his military tactic was nonviolence and passive right. resistance. Because whenever the enemy moved, the enemy exposed themselves to the whole world. Mm. You see? And, 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 and lost support in the world. Okay, so so let, let's let's take it back. Um and, and, and it, it's it's wild that we've talked about Vietnam and the South, and you know, I was just uh reading about uh, King's statement when he was talking about when they were bum rushed in Chicago mm -hmm. and how Chicago was the worst place that he had ever organized in. He said, right. we was in Mississippi, we was in Alabama. He said, I've never seen the level of hatred mm -hmm. that we saw out in uh, in, in Chicago, uh, which, which some people call up South, right? Right. Um, well, he agreed with, at that point, I, he understood what Malcolm was saying, but Malcolm was saying the Mason-Dixon line was at the Canadian border. That's right, that's they, right. <laughs> that, that, and he had, the Chicago thing was very dangerous. He almost lost his life in Chicago. That's right, that's right. Um, uh, Chicago isn't much different today. Mm -hmm. I worked in the streets of Chicago with Dorothy Tillman and other elected officials trying to fight against the same thing. To Chicago as as viciously anti-African today as it was in the days of Dr. King. It's, it's as segregated today as it was then. The police department is as much a terrorist organization today as it was then. Right on, right on. And the daily regime has it might change names and change colors and That's change genders, but it's the same program, different same program. The same different corporate thing. structure. That's right. The same banking interests, the same land owning interests, the same cultural interests that want to manipulate our socialization process by dominating the education of our children to make sure they're not competitors against other people's children. That's right. That's right. Going on across the country. We uh, call I'll, it by the wrong name, and that's why we miss it. Call about it as genocide. The UN right. calls it genocide. Read the UN Charter on Human Rights. And what's happening to African Americans is genocide, without, cultural without, genocide, without, economic without genocide, argument. political genocide, on all levels. All levels. On all levels. I, I mentioned Chicago because uh, uh, your homeboy from South Carolina, who's up in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, who ran with Dr. King, uh, Jesse Jackson. Of course, yeah. you know we've heard plenty of stories about his role, uh, his involvement between him and Andy Young. I wanted to know from from your research and your thoughts, uh, Jesse Jackson, MLK. You know, uh, we see that that infamous picture, and of course, we've heard different accounts that uh, he wasn't even on the balcony he when King was shot. Yeah, he was like, on the stairs getting the car. Let, 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 let's let's talk about that. What what are your thoughts on that? Because I understand that he he left town before. I mean, when when uh, other folks couldn't even leave town and all that. I mean, let, let's talk about that. What right. From what I understand from brothers and sisters who were players that day, everybody was asked to stay in town and to keep their mouth closed. Hmm. But instead, he went upstairs and put Doc's blood on his shirt. 
right. He was Everything upstairs true. when the shooting happened. All those people in the balcony pointing, only one of them was up there when that shot went on. Mm. Okay. Mm. And so that's that's the media framing some stuff to give you a false perspective. Jesse was not up there, you know. He came up after the shot was fired. He went, he was sent to get the car. Put his hand in the blood and rubbed it all yeah. in the shirt. And then went up north and said Doc died in his arms. And then the white folks said, you know, raised him up like he's the new leader. The organization right. made no such decision. That's right. I know that uh Sister Coretta never spoke to him again ever after wow. that day. Wow. And so that speaks volume to me because she knows what none of us will ever know. Hmm. She knows truths that none of us will ever know. That's and true. um we know that Dr. King's photographer was an FBI collaborator. He was a former policeman in Memphis. We know right. that we saw around Malcolm, all of the police agents and the collaborators, Well, you can bet they were around Dr. King too. That's right. You know, and they knew he was going to be killed. So do you, do you believe that, uh, that Jesse knew that he would be murdered, assassinated? I couldn't say that outright. I can say this from studying history. If you are not, if you are part, because let's put Jesse in another perspective. Who is his mentor? Some people are gonna get mad with your behind behind this one. Reverend, Reverend Proctor, who's the head of the boule. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So Jesse may not have been a a, a, a FBI spy, but he, he definitely was, was a boule spy. He was definitely plugged. The boule did not support Dr. King. Right. Mm. That that's yeah. interesting right there. Most Black church organizations did not support Dr. King. That's why he had to create SCLC. Because hmm. the Southern Baptist Conference didn't support him. He got more support from the Northern Methodist movement. But he didn't get the support from the NACP and the churches that they're pretending and feigning they gave when he was alive. Hmm. Because they saw him as too radical. So he, he started uh, SCLC, and later on, Jesse Jackson, Jacks, the Rainbow Coalition from Chairman Fred Hampton out in Chicago. Right. Um, which, of course, for folks that don't know, the Rainbow Coalition, the original Rainbow Coalition, was started by Chairman Fred, Fred Hampton of the Black Panther Party, right. uh, Illinois chapter. Um, and I know that even, even the wordplay, I remember you listen to Chairman Fred speak. And he used to say, you know, I am a revolutionary. And then mm -hmm. Jesse comes along saying, I am somebody. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, he, he leaves and, no crumbs. And you remember, Chairman Fred was a youth leading element in the NACP before he comes to the party. That's right. Age 14. Right. That's right. right. Had a and, fed file at age 14. Yes, sir. And so the, the, this thing has to do with the corporate structure, which we don't pay attention to. We don't know what Chase Manhattan is about in our community. Right. Or, 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 or Wells Fargo or the Bank of America or any of these corporate bodies. What are they doing in our community? And once I helped uh, in New York, I didn't know the young man's father was the top police officer in New York City, went to school with me. Mm. And me and some friends helped him go cold turkey because he got hooked in our dorm room. Hmm. We were just helping a brother. We were friends. And, and, and one of the main brothers was my roommate. And, and my roommate used to sell grass. And one day he brought some coke up in it as well. And I tasted it. And I remember my tongue got so heavy. I go like, Negroes got to be crazy. <laughs> to this stuff, right? But we helped this young man. So one day at City College, I'm now president of the student body. I'm crossing the street and a big limo pull up and a hand comes out the window and says, small. 
<laughs> you know what small I started doing, right? <laughs> I ran into the building because there's a hand calling my name out of a black limo. I get into the administration building, I get behind a pillow, and I look back, and the dude gets out and he's in full NYPD brass. Wow. And so I go back out. He tells me who he was. Turned out to be a beautiful brother and a comrade for the rest of my life. Mm. Um, the rest of his life. Um, and he told me, thank you for helping my son. I don't know who his son is, because I never made that equation. Then he tells me who the young man was. And at that time, we had taken over the state office building site in New York, 125th Street, where the state office building is. We were calling reclamation site number one. I mean, we were, we were locked and loaded. You know, we held it for about three months. And he came to me and says, because you helped me, I'm going to help you. <clears throat> he says, you need to leave that site because we're going to make a move. So you can tell your people, but I'm telling you. And we arguing back and forth. I'm doing my ideological thing. He the police, despite being nice to me. And he said, let me tell you something. He says, seven out of every 10 person on that site reports to somebody other than y'all. <clears throat> That's a man that can't be true. Seven out of 10? Listen, to it. Navy intelligence, Army intelligence, FBI, CIA, Justice Department, then this is the one that he hit me with, <clears throat> corporate intelligence. Mm. We never think of that one. That's when I first learned about corporate intelligence. Wow. Yeah. Corporate intelligence. I, stayed. I had, I moved my brothers out because I was in OAU then. I informed the other comrades, but I stayed until the arrest day, you know. And you will have to look in the newspaper to see how we battled that day. We took on a whole NYU force and we kicked their butts. Wow. You know, you know that's a whole nother story. They ain't about me today. They're about dog. But the point is, I believed Eddie and he proved himself a lover of his own community despite being a policeman. Over the years, I got to know him. Right. And I began to learn that when we, we, we look and says, oh, police undercover, but we don't think of black corporate undercover. We don't think of Boule undercover. Right. People who have an interest in the system and think we are shaking that foundation of that interest. I, I, I'm glad you're saying that because, you know, when folks talk about policing here in the United States, again, like you said, they talk about the local police, they talk about um, the FBI and the CIA and that's it they don't realize that there's over a thousand police agencies yes. in the United States. And we're not just talking about uh, local police departments, no. different agencies from cyber to, uh, like you said, to corporate. And so you have a, a, a brother like Dr. King, who is uh, for all practical purposes, fanning the flames. Yes. He has his nonviolent tactics. You can't come at him. He, he's he's quote unquote clean when it comes to the community. Right. You know what I'm saying? Of course, it was easier to demonize Malcolm. It was easier to demonize the Panther Party and BLA, right. so on and so forth. But to demonize this preacher from Atlanta, uh, this young young man, for all practical purposes, you know, was a little more difficult. And yeah. and the tactics were it was like a slow burn. Mm -hmm. a slow burning pot, slow cooking situation. Um, so he has all these people that he's pissed off. Mm -hmm. and, and, and some yeah. of them had put money in the movement to try and steer him in a certain direction. He mm -hmm. wouldn't go. He took their money and helped to move them, but he went in the direction that he felt our community should go. Right on. Now, talking about that, would that be something similar to the March on Washington? Because I understand that there were different uh, players that were positioned. Right. Well, the March on Washington started, like Malcolm said, in the streets of, uh, of the so-called ghettos. Right. And the, the leadership element that was really pushing the march was the Black Labor This thing had gotten organized. John Kennedy himself. Hmm. called together Dr. King and multiple others, civil rights leaders at the time, and said, we will finance you all and put you into the leadership of this thing because if it comes the other way, 
we can't handle it because the talk then was closing down DC. Right. Not just the march down to DC, but closing the government. And they were afraid of that. And so right. they brought in, um, what's the guy name? Um, to organize it. Uh, but they, um, I, I, I can't think of his name. I got, got his yeah. picture in my head right yeah. now. Russell. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, be, 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 be. Uh, uh, yeah. Back well, anyway, would it be? Yeah, <laughs> and, um, it be? yeah, um, not Barnard. Uh, I can't think of his name, Rustin. Uh, but any, and then the other thing they did was the government was able to get the, the labor unions, which normally moves with the radical element. But when you go up in the labor movement, the labor movement is pretty much run by organized crime, right? They're the ones that's got their hands in the till building in Las Vegas and the other enterprises they were building. And so the government was able to go to the labor union and said, well, we need your help to work, to do this. So that meant we can control the busing, we can control, you know, and they took the march away from the people. You know, Malcolm said they told him when to get into town and when the sun went down, when to leave town. <laughs> and he was absolutely right. Uh, yeah. Bertrand Russell, or Bertrand Russell was some other guy there. But, uh, he was the, the 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 administrative organizer for for the uh, what we call the, um, the he wasn't the strategist he he was more the guy that took care of making all the pieces linked together right right and right. um but the, in, in short the government took it over they didn't let James Baldwin speak um a few other people I don't think Stokely was allowed to speak um, was the young uh, he was young then, the, the white actor who was very radical, Native American blood. Uh, they decided who would speak and who wouldn't speak. Right, right, you know? right. And 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 so, because the fear was, and then they take Dr. King's speech and mutilate it, because the the they tell us it's the I have a dream speech. That was not the name of his speech. Hmm. His speech was based on reparations, and when you read it, it's a beautiful speech. Is more radical than most of Malcolm's speeches. Wow. But the last paragraph, which was not in the written speech, where he ad libs a sermon, because Mahalia Jackson asked him to do it, whispering from behind, saying, Martin, um, yeah. you know, that, that was the truth. And Martin, mm -hmm. do that sermon you did on the I Have a Dream. So he dropped that in as the last paragraph. It's not a part of his written speech at all. If you look at the historical record, you'll see. Wow. Then they take that make it the, the spirit of the speech instead of taking you've given us a a, a a check that has come back insufficient funds right know instead of talking about how we worked for slavery for free and you didn't pay us i mean if you read the speech it, it's a it's a, it's a supporting ally of reparations but they don't even let you touch that and even today the average african-american person has never read the speech they have never read that speech. They don't know right. what Martin said that day that was so extraordinary Man. and made the people happy. They took the last ad lib paragraph and made that the essence of the speech, the body of the speech, and the the, the, the point of the speech, which it was not. I don't even think when you say they haven't read it, I, I think most people I ran across haven't even listened to Dr. King pass I Had a Dream. Right. You know what I'm okay. saying? Let's, let's take it to that level. And that's yeah. why I always say, my brother Glenji, history is one of the biggest weapons we got that we don't use. That's right. History is one of the biggest and most significant weapon we have that we don't use. And Dr. Nobles, my friend, Dr. Wade Nobles, always says, yes. history allows you to erase the mystery. That's Knowledge right. of your history allows you to erase the mystery so you can work your magic. Yes, sir. You know? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So... Okay, so on this day, 54 years ago, mm -hmm. King is assassinated. Yes, You're sir. a young man, a uh, mm -hmm. little, little younger than you are now, because you know we know you're still <laughs> young. You be trying, you trying to throw us with the old man thing. We ain't having that. <laughs> but um, he he was uh, you know, so he he's assassinated. You know, take us back. What was you know we we know over 100 cities burned. What was you know. What, what was that like for you, just being a young man and you're hearing that you, you've, you've lived through the assassination of Malcolm? 
and now they 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 murdered King. I just walked in from work, walked into my mother's living, and the TV was on and it was being announced. And everybody was just in a state of shock. You know, people immediately started crying. Um, my mom, my cousin CW was there and he was like just through, you know, and he went back in the room. And first thing he did, he went back in the room, got his gun because you could hear it, you know, mm. and he was a numbers runner. So wow. Um, wow. I called Sister Ella, Malcolm's sister. She was my leader. She was the president. And we were all told to report to our headquarters, which is on 139th Street, or your headquarters, between 7th and 8th Avenue. Now, but before you go, just for clarity, um, so she was the president of the OAU, mm -hmm. and I was okay. the imam of the Muslim mosque. Inc. Okay, and this is Malcolm's older sister Ella, correct? Yeah. Okay. And, and 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 so I reported to headquarters to Brother Stock and Haji Sham, and I can't tell you what we discussed or what we did, but a short while later we hit the streets with the rest of the people. And um, I teamed up with some of my other comrades on 25th Street. Um, New York didn't get hit as bad as many cities because there was um, a decision made in a meeting that we're not going to burn Harlem down. We're not going to burn Best Side down. We're going to get in the streets and we're going to stop everything else from functioning. We're going to stop the businesses from functioning. And one of our leaders was the brother who found the gods of uh, the gods. Nation of God's nerves. Yes, the okay. five percent is his brother Clarence. Okay, um, who was a very strong, powerful brother, and um, he called his troops into the streets, and you know, made it disruptive enough. Half the police force was in our community, but we didn't destroy the community mm. because we couldn't figure out how to redo that. There, there was always some discussion around uh, things that happened earlier. But there were some, there were a lot of fires and burning going on, but it could have been much, much worse um, throughout the black community. But all of the forces teamed up, the nationalist forces, the Muslim forces, uh, Mayor Lindsay, who was the mayor of the city, was moving with us through the streets. Charlie Wangle was moving with us, who was our congressman, and many of the other brothers from different organizations, making sure that our people didn't get killed and our people didn't get arrested and that sort of thing. So and, you guys are structured pretty well out there. You yeah. The, the, and those, and those at customers. the same time, let all the business know y'all got to close down, shut your door, pull your shutters, go home. Because you ain't doing no business in this community today or tomorrow. Hmm. And so that's how it went. Some some of it got out of hand. We were running around all night. Um, but that's that's how we moved on it. And our position was we didn't need a bunch of brothers in jail. We couldn't get out and a bunch of brothers killed that we couldn't justify. But we still had to stop the system from functioning. And, and we did that. Mm. The next day, uh, a committee was sent to Memphis um, that Ella had organized so we could know for ourselves what had occurred there. And I remember one of the things when McKinney called back that night that there was a tree in front of the Lorraine Motel balcony two weeks before. This tree had now been cut down mm. a few days before Doc got there. The Dr. Mm. King was staying in town. He was aware that something was wrong because he didn't stay at the Lorraine Hotel. He was staying in town at the Hilton on one of those big hotels. But he was goaded by some of his own people to go back to the Lorraine Hotel under the guise that um, the people may think you, you've abandoned them. You're talking about economics, you're talking about, but you're down here town at the White Hotel. And he moved back over there. Whoever wow. those persons was, was a part of the setup. That's crazy. And the next day he's killed. So the, next day, the same day, he's killed that same day, mm -hmm. at six o'clock. Um, so the tree was directly in front of the hotel, you said? Directly in front of that balcony. Okay, okay. I, I, everybody I, I, talked about it. Yeah, that, that's wild. Because I've been to the balcony. I actually got pictures yeah. in front of it. Yeah, right. in front of that balcony when he stayed in that same room two weeks right. before. Wow. But now it's not there. And and just some, you know, and I remember that day. I remember watching the TV. Nobody 
all right? That's why that film on the balcony is such a fake film that everybody pointed up. Right. That happened. Doc is dead already. Hmm. Right? Right. Those people who are pointing, none of them was on the balcony when the shot was fired. And I remember that day clearly that everybody said it came from the bushes. And that's so they were posing. Well, yes. so they, were, they were posing, pointing in the opposite direction. They were pointing in another direction. All right. And and people were saying then, and they were interviewing people right under the bound of people saying the, the shot came from over there. Wow. They weren't pointing up at no rooming house. If you can get the news clip from back then, you see on ABC, CBS, and so forth. They were pointing, and I was just making some notes. And, and one of the questions I was going to ask, like, why was a weed covered hill between the boarding house and the Lorraine Motel a place where some people? reported seeing smoke immediately after the shooting and a man fleeing the area. The Memphis equivalent of Dallas, Grassy Knoll, cleared by the city workers just hours after the killing of Dr. King. They brought people in to cut all those weeds and grasses. Wow. So so there, there, so there couldn't possibly be a proper investigation. Right. Because yeah. you, you destroyed the crime scene, quote unquote. And then on the roof of the big building across the street, which everybody has admit to is the army intelligence people, hmm. some in military uniform, right. photographing the scene. Right there. And then there's the black fireman who's in the firehouse across the street, all transferred to another firehouse or told to take the day off that day. And the one black fireman who wouldn't take the day off, they fired him. I forgot his name. I did a show with him back in the 1980s talking about this stuff. Right, 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 right. Okay, okay. Wow. So, and, and there's more. So, why would Ray, and this is the part that gets you, dump a rifle he bought, possibly laden with his fingerprints in a conspicuous spot near the scene of the crime. That was the stupidest thing that he dropped the bag at the door. Come and give me, you know, I mean, so childish. They pulled that one off, but they pulled it off and they got away with it in the minds of the world because the media did what the government asked them to do. And they helped they help to uh, promote this, promote the lie itself. That's right. Who who was that one person that was on the balcony with King when he was assassinated? Do you know? Um, he was the um, he was another minister. I can't remember his name. And um, he they were going to go down together. Jesse had been sent down to get the car, and some others went down so they could line up because they were going to another brother's house for dinner, hmm. another minister house for dinner. Um, but I forgot who that brother. I I would I don't think he was a negative factor. Oh, he, was, he was the security there for him. Right. Um, but, you know, he, whoever, that was for one bullet, that, that's a sniper, that's an expert. Knew where to, where to plan that bullet. I did, I, I trained in sniping in the military. One shot. Right. All you need if you Absolutely. know where to plant it. That's right. And he knew where to plant it. And, um, and again, if you go back, if you get a chance to go back and look at some of the news footage from that day, you'll see that everybody's pointing to the grassy spot, not to that balcony. Only those people on the balcony who were put there to point for that right. picture. Right. So it's the people that, people that people that weren't even there right. was there pointing to where it was at. Where, and they where, weren't where, even on the scene. Where the shot came from. Right. Which okay. is crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's but a, we know that in the civil trial. That sister Coretta and the family push. What year was that? And um, uh, was it nineteen ninety or something? Or when was that? Um, and I wrote it down. Sometimes you write down notes to get where you put your notes. But in that civil trial, it showed that James L. Ray couldn't have done it, and and that was the conclusion of the trial. I think um, was that that ninety five or somewhere around there, or I was looking for the date. They had over 70 witnesses in that in that trial, 99, 99. 99 at the civil trial. Okay. And, and and the civil trial concluded that um, Ray couldn't have done it and that it was a conspiracy and it had to have involved the government. And that's what the trial concluded. And then a pretty boy, um, the little Alabama criminal who was a, a, a president, um, What's his name? His wife wanted to be president. Um, uh, what are you talking about from Alabama? Clinton. Oh, Clinton. 
Oh, Clinton Bandit. Super Bandit. Right, and right, and right. then then he he launches an investigation after the civil trial. And 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 uh and then they had the lady attorney general Reno right. uh come up with a conclusion that the civil trial conclusion had no bearings, you know. But there's right. a good book out that I would recommend to people. I, I just ordered it to myself, Simon and Schuster. And it's called Who Really Killed Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. And 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 uh, it said one of the most in, infamous and devastating assassination in American history, the murder of the civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. was also one of the most quickly resolved by authorities in arresting James L. Ray. But what this guy shows very clearly that Lyndon Baines Johnson, J. Edgar Hoover, CIA and FBI hands were covered with Dr. King's blood. Right on. Hey, and he's me... not the only author, there have been multiple authors that have done research on this, but I think who really killed Martin Luther King Jr. It's a book that people should buy and begin to do some research and study. We do not have to accept our murderers and our uh, those who practice genocide against us to tell us what harm they did or didn't do to us. That's right. So what, what, who was the author of that book, just for the record? For, uh... um, yes, sir. Let me... Philip F. Nelson. Okay. okay. Philip F. Okay. Nelson. Who Definitely. really killed Martin Luther King Jr. I just ordered it for myself. Okay, um, right on. I'm right in Schuster uh, uh, Press. Definitely get on that. I know that um, one of the things they talked about was the 100, uh, uh, 111 uh, military intelligence group who was associated with the whole Phoenix assassination program in Vietnam mm -hmm. were the people that were actually um, served, uh, had King under surveillance. Right, for, and they were the people up on that roof that day. Right, 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 time. right. So, I mean, that that just the fact that these are some assassins who came up out of Vietnam with the whole Phoenix program. Mm -hmm. They happen to be in Memphis on top of a roof mm -hmm. as King is assassinated, mm -hmm. and they don't see anything. They're taking pictures. Right. You know they're what I'm saying? Pictures, but they ain't seeing nothing. Yeah, the trees, trees clear, everything's good. They mm -hmm. ain't see nobody. You got Jesse and 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 uh, uh, Abernathy and and Jose Williams, Andy pointing in the different in a different direction, you know. But no one actually saw anything. Um, I mean, this is like the wildest. Um, it, it's like a one of those uh, what do you call them stories? Like a like a sci-fi type novel type thing. Well, well, the one guy that's truly loyal to Dr. King, and they tried to defame him, and that's Abernathy. Hmm. Abernathy is a loyalist, and right. and and what's the other brother name they put in the mental hospital? Um, James uh, Orange or Bevel? Bevel. Bevel. Okay. Bevel. Okay. Bevel. 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 Okay. Or the, yeah. Or the Bevel was a military strategist for Doc. Hmm. A lot of the things we saw them did that was Bevel's idea. Bevel was the strategist. Hmm. I really can tell you that, you know, and 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 Abernathy was a loyalist. I can't speak for none of those others. You know, right uh, right I never it, met them. It, it I, met Bevel. I took classes under Bevel, so I knew what he was, and I know one of his closest friends, Sister Dorothy Tillman, who was alderman in Chicago. Um, and I remember when they locked Bevel up down there some years before he died, she was the one that went and got him out of jail. But they kept trying to say Bevel was insane and he was crazy. Bevel wasn't crazy. You know, Bevel was the one person telling the truth, and he, from the beginning, he said Ray didn't do it. Hey man, listen. In, any any time you resist in this country, you crazy. Uh, the, the enslaved Africans had uh, what's that? Drapetomia, because mm -hmm. uh, you know you talked about running away. So you you got to be crazy. Tell me, running away from this good white man? Yeah. Who, who gonna whoop your ass like this? Who gonna who gonna yeah. mistreat you like like they do? Yeah. You know, so, so when we think of Dr. King, he's one of the greatest revolutionary leaders. See, we got caught in the, and I'm going to say this too, and I ain't trying to hurt no brother's feelings or step on no brother's or sister's feet. Right you know, on. we allowed the white Marxist left, hmm. say that again, on the clarity, the white Marxist left to begin to interpret the hmm. history of our struggle. You, you might you might have to say that again. I don't think they heard you. You yes, might, might the white loosen up my locks. Left. 
yes. to interpret the history of our struggle, especially that period of struggle from the late 50s to the late 80s. That, that was, right. what, what would make you say that, Dr. Small? Uh, there's a good book everybody should read by Brother Hal Cruz. It's called okay. Plural but Equal. Okay. You know, and where he where he does a critique right. of the civil rights movement. There are certain white ethnic groups who didn't have the Southern franchise, just like we didn't have it, and was discriminated against in the South, just like we were. But they were bottled up in the Northeast with their overabundance of capital and trained personnel. But the civil rights movement gave them the Southern franchise. And then they collaborated with the same people we were fighting against to make sure we didn't profit from the damn civil rights movement in the South mm. the way we should have and could have. And that same group makes up the leadership of the white radical left. And if you look in Congress today, they're heading all of the major committees and they're totally overrepresented based on their voting numbers and the positions they hold in Congress, because we've always been bamboozled to vote for them because they're supposed to be our mythical allies. Mm. Now, mythical allies. Me, I think I've been clear enough. I don't have to injure the show or <laughs> anything else to tell you the truth. But know the truth, and Malcolm said it should set you free. And so right. when you have somebody else who has another political agenda, and if you believe I'm wrong, look at how the devil crossed W.B. Du Bois. If you believe I'm wrong, look at how the devil crossed Paul Robeson. If you believe I'm wrong, look at how they fought against Marcus Garvey. If you believe I'm wrong, you will find out if you do your research that they assassinated Booker T. Washington. We need to learn to do our own historical research. We need to understand why Booker came up here for a meeting with T. Thomas Fortune, with, um, uh, what's his name, W.B. Du Bois, um, some some of these uh, white radical leftists in order to settle a rift between him and Monroe Trotter. Gets sick at the meeting, never recovered. They put him in St. Luke's Hospital. He realized he's dying. He sent a telegram to Tuskegee, asking his wife and aide to come and get him. He died on a train in Baltimore on the way back to Tuskegee. <clears throat> they poisoned Booker. Wow. Did they know Booker had already invited Marcus Garvey to come and join him and that Garvey was on the way coming? It said Booker dies a few months before Garvey get here. Do they know that? Study history, erase the white man's mystery. Tell your own damn story and you get it right. So so what 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 are your thoughts on on on, on folks like Marx? Because you know, since since we we are on that side of the fence right now, but you know, folks um, like who? Marx, Karl Marx, and, Marx. And, and some, yeah. He was a good white man for white people, but he was very <laughs> clear. He wasn't trying to do an analysis that he, none of his analysis dealt with the resolution of slavery or colonialism in Africa. Mm. He was talking about white working class people who became working class because they were robbing Africa. Mm. You know? Now, the yeah. methodology of organization strategically is pretty good. I mean, like one, two, three, God, like dancing to, to music song. But we could have that same understanding if we studied the African system of communal, collective, and cooperative structuring and building, since we built the only civilizations ever built in the world anywhere. But we are studying the people who never built nothing except carrying on a 100-year war and a 30-year war and the war of roses and, and the killing of women. And oh, please, let's start studying history and reassessing the mistakes we made, you know? I, I liked Putin. Putin was in Tanzania training the leaders for Ferlimo and, 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 and Swapo. Yes, this Mr. Putin, as a military intelligence officer of his government, was in Africa helping us to fight the freedom movement against America and Europe. So I'm not mad with the Marxists but I haven't seen Marxism work anywhere in the world. People say, oh, but look at Cuba. No, what worked in Cuba is Africanism with the Marxist twist. You talk about the Marxist twist, but you want to talk about the Africanism. Fidel talked about the Africanism. Why won't you? Right. 
And why do you think that 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 folks? Because I, I noticed that when we talk about um, when we talk about our, our liberation uh, movement as a whole, when we talk mm-hmm. about struggle, when we talk about resistance, oftentimes uh, Africa is left out of the equation. Folks talk about Africa as if um, you know, well, well that, that's you know, culture doesn't have a bearing on 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 our, our, our struggle and movement, and that's that point of confusion. Emma Carl Gabral. Hmm. And let Gabral lead Gabral's statement on the role of culture and revolution. I know. You don't liberate a people to be something other than themselves. You liberate a people to restore the integrity of themselves. That's right. Okay. And so ignorance is why we respond that way. Because if you look, and let me just get nasty, let's go back to BPP. Okay. Yes. What was the riff? When Webb was murdered on 125th Street, you know, and I remember running down the hill that day, and Mark was laying there pistol whip almost to death in a struggle between the East Coast and West Coast, but it wasn't a struggle between the East Coast and West Coast, it was a struggle between black nationalism and Marxism. Hmm. Okay. I remember just a week before being with Zay Shakur, who headed the Brown staff to the party. And we were listening to um, a, a radio broadcast from Eldridge. We you know, know that we call them rage because we always raging about some stuff. Probably. And we were trying to figure out what was this position coming from the West Coast dealing with this concept of the lump of proletariat, which is cool. You know, lump of proletariat mean the unemployed and the unemployable and the people on welfare. That would be the vanguard of the revolution. And in many cases, that's who is the vanguard because they got nothing to lose. But then you can't justify a relationship to CPUSA, Communist Party USA. Who are they? They've infiltrated from the top to the bottom. So what are you talking about? Where's this money coming from from them? Again, the radical white left. Hmm. I ain't tracing them to Tel Aviv or no place like that. I'm just going to the radical white left. Has been interpreting our movement, interpreting the history of our movement, interpreting who our leadership critical leadership really was and interpreting what we were really fighting for. Well, I don't listen to none of that. I need to do my own studies. Right on. Okay. I need to know who my leaders are. I'm not saying Marxism, like any ideology, has good tools. But Marxism, I mean, I have to bring into my living room my enemy because he has learned this tool better than me know. Look at Africa. Look, if you believe I'm wrong, look at Angola. Tell me what has happened there. Look at Mozambique. Tell me what has happened there. And tell me who were the players from the white radical left. Look at Namibia. That was more African-centered in controlling SWAPO and I was happy to see my old friend, President Inyomo, a few months ago, because when the, the war was going in Ethiopia, another friend went over to um, Namibia just to get some peace. And she sends me a picture. She's on it, over here with a friend, and, and he knows you, and his president, former President Inyomo. Hmm. So we have to make sure we are telling the story, what happened in the Black movement. What happened with Dr. King and Malcolm? How many people know that two weeks before Malcolm is killed, there's a meeting at Ruby Dee's brother Tom's house in Queens, and all of the civil rights leaders was there. Dr. King was the only one that wasn't there, but he sent his rep. And they all agreed to work with Malcolm and the OAU. Mm. That Fannie Lou invited Malcolm to come to Mississippi to give a major speech, which was to take place two weeks after the date he was assassinated. How many people know that Malcolm was supposed to be with Che Guevara, and that's what Che Guevara, at the behest of Ahmed Ben Bella hmm. in Algeria, two weeks after the date he was killed, and Malcolm and Che was going to be the keynote speaker at a non-aligned conference. Wow. How many people say, if you understand history, erase the mystery, you know who pulled the trigger and why? Yes, of course. They, they, they couldn't possibly let that happen because... Absolutely not. I mean, Malcolm's whole, I mean, when you talk about uh, Africans in America, 
his whole style, his whole uh, rhythm and cadence mm -hmm. was a representation of us. So much so that when I hear certain people talk about Malcolm these days, it infuriates me. Mm -hmm. Because we know that Malcolm wasn't a sucker. Yep. And we know that so many of these folks utilize his name in vain, as they would say. Oh, yeah. Told him you know to change that he now changed. Mal Mal Malcolm, I, you know, I remember when he came back to the country. I wasn't in the country at the time. I was in France. And he made that last trip when he came back and, and, and the guy asked him something about race. And Malcolm says, well, you know, I, I learned. And it was Ahmed Ben Bella he was talking to. When Ben Bella said, well, look at me. My skin's white. Right. So Malcolm said, I learned I couldn't judge people just by the color of their skin. I must judge them by their behavior. Right. And then he, he laughed and he said, and we know how these people over here are consciously behaving. I mean, like, you know, he was so good with speech. Right. If you wanted to learn, right. right, he could teach you to understand that he was clear. I need the revolutionaries of the world to support me. So I have to change my rhetoric. I have to right. change the way I approach this, but I don't have to lose my senses that don't understand who my enemy is. You know, right. it's like the right. thing when they said he went to Mecca and he saw white people. That's Malcolm lied a little bit there. He was trying to stay alive. Okay. Right. Right. And people right. wanted to kill him. Right. He was trying to stay alive. Malcolm went to the Middle East in 1957. You think all the white people had moved away for a minute while he was there and then they come back after he left? Right. <laughs> in 1957, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad made his pilgrimage to Mecca. Malcolm opened those, those he, he was the preceding instrument. And I know he went to Mecca. And so anybody in or out of the neighborhood would want to say, because when I went to Mecca, yes, I did twice. I'm al Hajjamin Shaheed. Hmm. I'm not that anymore. I said that behind, because that's not our tradition. That's hmm. a tradition that was forced on upon us and we adopted and we've used it well in Africa, but that's not our tradition. Hmm. We have our own tradition. And so I'm into that. But when I went to the Rabat Alim al Islamim, the World Muslim League, the first person they asked me about was Hajj Muhammad. Hmm. Shocked me. I didn't know the messenger had made his Hajj. Some people said, oh, he just went and made Umrah, which is a Hajj that's not on the date of Hajj, but no. But Rabat Alim al Islamim said Hajj Muhammad. Hmm. So he did make his Shahada out there. Yes, he did. And, and he, and he made but he our, chose made, not to, to to use that religious format because he said himself he was not going to move his people from under one cultural dominance right. and put them under another one. And he was so right. The way the messenger taught Islam in America was the most appropriate approach to teaching Islam to black people anywhere in America because you did not surrender your identity to practice a religion that is supposed to have a universality. You see? So the message was on point the way he organized the nation, him and Malcolm. When Malcolm came, there wasn't much of a nation there. And I, I'm tired of seeing people taking away the work that Malcolm did in the nation because for most of the work he did in his teachings was in the nation. He was only out of the nation one year when he was assassinated. And we right. tend to focus everything on that one year. No, focus on the work that brother did when he was in the nation. The tens of thousands of brothers and sisters who came out of jail that he pulled into the nation, who he cleaned up, who became doctors and lawyers and businessmen and family men and, and small business owners and workers who might have been drug addicts and alcoholics and prison bait and dead had it not been for the way Malcolm talked the message that the messenger gave him to teach. Nobody else has been able to duplicate it all these years. Oh. So when you when you talk about, and, and, and I'm glad that you're speaking on that, um, Malcolm uh, came into consciousness, quote unquote. I mean, it hadn't been like, what, 11, 12 years, something like that before he was assassinated? No, he, yeah. He, I wouldn't say he came into consciousness. Not, not consciousness. What I, I mean, yeah. joining the Nation of Islam. Yeah, I'm sorry. he joined yeah. the Nation of Islam. It's eleven yeah. years. Okay, okay. Yeah, we know. We know his father. Came from a very conscious family. 
Absolutely. You know, his dad was a Gabiite, his mom was a Gabiite. They were both participants in the Gabi organization as workers. They weren't right. just people going to the meeting. And so even though he was young when his father was killed and his mom was taken away in just about his beginning, his teen years, his sister Ella was about as radical as they came. Right on. You know, and very wealthy in her radicalism. People and how did you get involved with, 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 with the family? Because I know you mentioned being... Um, uh, I, I lived in her home for over 11 years. Wow. And this was after his assassination? I was, I was married in Ella's bedroom 51 wow. years ago. Wow. You know? And me and my sister, we're still together 51 years later. Wow. Um, you know, I, I ran the business. We had a real estate business. And that's how we financed OAU. Because we didn't have to reach money from nobody else. You know, we had 14 rooming houses. And my job was to keep them rolling and keep them humming. How long did the OAU last? Because I know that folks talk about it as if, you know. It's gone. We still exist. Right on. We're just not a big formation as Malcolm had hoped and tried. We still exist. We still do work. But we learned some lessons from history. You you don't put yourself on an advertising poster when you're fighting an enemy. That's right. Um, Malcolm, the nephew, Rodney L. Perkins, Collins, Ella's son is the president. I'm the international vice president. Right on. Um, and I'm the organizer of the pilgrimage to his grave, which we've done for 56 years nonstop. Thousands of people come every year. And we don't advertise. We decided, the brothers decided this year we will advertise. One of the arms of the organization is called the Sons of Africa, right. um, which we organized 40 years ago. Mm. As in, and they, even though I still preside, they are the ones that run all of the operations. Right on, right so on. So we, we, we know we're not an advertising agent. We're just trying to do some work, both here and on the continent of Africa and in the Caribbean. Um, cause we realize it's not about the name anymore. It's really, there's no one organization is going to lead out people to freedom. Right. Um, no one ideological perspective is going to settle this problem of unity among African peoples. We have to find a way to collaborate with one another through a Pan-African prism and trying to, um, bring about the kind of unity that allow us to take our continent back. And we'll get gay, engaged in foolish argument about uh, who came to America first. I don't give a damn who came to America first. I just want to be free. Right. Where right. I'm at, okay. Right. Right. Anyone that know anything about history, anthropology, paleontology, and archaeology know that the African is the aborigine every place on the planet Earth. So why having a discussion about North American foolishness? Okay. Right. Right. Um, right. And others have moved around the earth as people have always moved around the earth based on necessity and the need to find food, clothing, and shelter for themselves and their people. So the, the Mongolian population came. We call them Indians. Um, they never call themselves Indians. White folks call them that. You know? Right now. Um, They're good at renaming people. Huh? Yeah. We were here when, when they got here. And right. they decided to enslave all of our asses. They burnt our village and made our village all along the East Coast. Right on. Anyway, all He's like, don't up. trip. We all can get it. Right. Right. But the fundamental question is freedom. How do we acquire freedom? And unity is essential for a people, especially. And unity is essential to control the real estate that has the wealth that will ensure your freedom. And that is the continent of Africa. It's the wealthiest piece of real estate on the planet Earth. And we are still being exploited by the colonialists at a higher level than we was in 1945. And yet we're saying we're free, but we have flag independence and we don't have real independence in Africa. And that, I'm talking about every single country. Now, there's not a single independent free African nation. The closest that it that came was in Krumah's Ghana mm. and Magafule and, um, uh, what's our brother who who um, organized Tanzania? Uh, uh, Nyeri. Julius Nyeri. Yeah. And and the young brother who died mysteriously last year, President Magafule of Tanzania. Right. And so when we look at their works, you know, South Africa is not free. We just have black people managing apartheid. You know, right on. We need what's, to be clear your, about it. What's your thoughts on Ethiopia the crisis over there? America was behind that war against the government of Ethiopia. 
Ethiopia had, was pulling out of the American sphere and collaborating and working economically with China on all kinds of levels and being had all kinds of economic success. And even some of the, the people who were from the northern, the, the Tigrania group fighting have come forward and said, we were backed by America. You know, this whole thing that Obama did when he forced AFRICOM, meaning the American military operation on bases all around Africa. And he put something like about 30 drone bases in Africa. The last thing Obama signed leaving office was the, the, the document authorizing the bombing of Somalia by American right, right. Uh, military. So we need to just study history, contemporary right. history. And you know, a lot of the shit you can find, just Google it, man. Right. <laughs> and all kinds of stats and information is there. Let's stop being ignorant and say we fighting an enemy and we know nothing about the enemy. We know nothing about ourselves. We know nothing about our situation. We don't know how we got in the situation. How are we going to plan and plot a way out of it? Right. Know how we got here. And it, yeah. that, that's a very important part, too, because we have so many folks who think that our first encounter as African people was under uh, or our first uh, uh, visit or, or staying or or living uh, experience here in this particular right on this particular island was that of enslavement. Right. And, you know, they don't go past that. So it's just like, okay. Let's you... just read Columbus's diary. Columbus right. talks about the Ethiopian he meets, his brother's diary. He talks about the Ethiopian that was his guys. Um, uh, what's the guy named up in New York? Verrazano writes about the Ethiopian and black folks he meets. We were here when they got here. And then if you go and study the history of Mali, Look at the, the early Muslim writers, Arab Muslim writers. They talked about the Malian uh, king who came here and brought thousands of ships with him. But if, if you want to really understand, just look at the history of Central South America. Even, um, uh, was the hit, what did you call it? Um, the magazine, uh, the historical magazine with the yellow thing on it, um, you know, opals. Down in uh, National Geographic. Okay, right, right. Uh, did a whole thing last year on the original black folks down in Argentina. Okay, and 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 then meeting with some of their descendants and said this is the last of them. Who the hell do you think the rest of us are? Right. And Leron Bennett wrote a book, Shaping a Black America. He has a chapter called The Red and the Black, and in that chapter, he showed that the white folks says. The indigenous population, especially on the East Coast, was as black as the population from Africa. So let's raid their villages and put them all in slave. And that's what they did. And the ones who were here already amalgamated with the ones who came from Africa. Now, some of us did escape, went to the Dominican Republic. Some of us went to Haiti and some of us went to Bermuda. See, that's the history people need to know. This is before, these are the people who were here before 1619 ever happened. That's a myth. You know, this time, this heavy focus on the 1619 thing, again, is our radical white left friends. Because you focus on an acting like black studies never existed when we had fought throughout the 60s and 70s, put black studies in almost every college in America, right. in every school system in the country from Detroit to St. Louis and so forth. And now you're acting like we're doing a start over right. without mentioning any of the past history. You know? Right. San Francisco State led that movement, and then San Jose State, and then City College in New York. We were the first three, and then Cornell, and then it boomerang around the country, you know. Mm. And we built departments that was educating thousands and tens of thousands of kids a year. And then you came in in the '90s and tried to destroy all of it. And by 2000, you had wiped out most black studies department in the country. Wow. So study the history and you know, it'll erase the mystery and allow you to work your black magic. So yeah. we say to our big brother, Dr. Martin Luther King, on this day, yes, sir. that we celebrate your having lived for our benefit. And we appreciate, because you knew you were going to die if you stayed the course and you stayed that course and you gave your life for us. And we appreciate that you gave your life for us, knowing that's what the cost of freedom was. Mm. said the price of freedom is death. That's right. That's, That's right. what he said is freedom or death. That's right. And you proved that, Dr. King, um, that you were willing to 
to go to course, even though you know what the consequences were. But we want to let our enemies and still the living collaborators know, we know you murdered that young man. And some of you only got a fistful of dollars for doing it. That's right. You know? That's right. And the government hey. of the United States, this you will you're going to find out one day, or your children, great children will find out one day that that was one of the worst mistakes you ever made in the history of this nation. Hmm. Was to kill that young man. Baba, it is uh, first of all, let me just say uh it, it is uh more than an honor. Definitely appreciate you stopping through the rap, especially on short notice. We just rapped yesterday. Yeah, so, yeah. Yes. yeah. But I, I, I couldn't uh, think of anyone who would I who I would rather have on to speak on this particular uh, subject matter than yourself. So I really appreciate, you know, you stopping through and, uh, yes, and, and, and rocking with us and and feeding us more than just uh, uh, all things Martin, because, of course, you know, Dr. King deserves his his due. Absolutely. But there are so many others as well who uh, who who are often uh, uh, overlooked for a lack of better words. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to ask you in, in closing, because I know you got things to do. Um, right now, one of the big, uh, uh, the big, big convos and, and, and water cooler conversations and all that that's going on is around this whole uh, Supreme Court nominee, Katanji uh, Jackson Brown and or Brown Jackson, I'm not sure which way. I wanted to know your thoughts on uh, her nomination, uh, especially since we found out, or we know that the Fraternal Order of Police are one of the groups that uh, have uh, officially been backing and sponsoring and and, and, and co-signing for her. I wanted to know your thoughts on uh, this, this nomination of uh, Katanji. Well, unfortunately, in a system that we don't understand, and if we did, we'd be more fully participant in taking control of it where it affects our lives. We have to settle for minimal victories and hope that they can do some maximum good from their position. Um, the fraternal lot of police have never been a friend of our community. They have defended every murder that has ever taken place by their members against our community and our children. Um, so that makes you very suspicious of the kind of litigation position she would take on issues concerning black people and African-American people, because I'm not a people of color. And when you want to address me, address me as an African-American. And again, with my brothers and sisters confused, Africa is my race, my culture and ancestral heritage, and America is my geopolitical place. That's why I participate in politically, socially, culturally, economically. So that's not a contradiction. So we need to put certain things in context. Um, like so many of our people who rise within the system, race don't seem to be first. So we have a situation, and I don't hold it against Anybody can marry whoever they want, fall in love with whoever they want. I have no issue with that. And some of our people who have been married to white people have been some of the most contributing element in our community. You know, even Fred Douglas, who married that into that community late in his life, he was married to an African woman most of his life who passed away. Fred Douglas continued to contribute to our community. We have a vice president. Unfortunately, though, it's becoming such a trend now that only Blacks who are engaged in interracial relationships end up in these high positions. I don't know what that means. Right. But we see it with the general. We see it with the new Supreme Court justice. We see it with the vice president and others. And I'm saying, what does that mean? Even with Obama, it wasn't it, it wasn't him and his wife, but it was his mother. Right. So, so his yeah, mother I, and his grandparents who raised him. Right. Right. So. I'm asking, what does that trend mean? That an African-American can only rise to the top if we have, if, if our partnership in life is not another racial member. That's mm -hmm. something black people would think about. And I don't mean this in no disrespect to that sister, because given what the other options are, I'd rather have her. 
Hmm. I haven't studied all of her works, but the little bit I've seen, she's done some good work on some of her cases. But I'm not a lawyer or a judge, so I, I don't. I have to look at it like a layperson in that regards. But it does make you feel uncomfortable when she's supported by the police. Absolutely. Because the police department in America is not a police department. It's an ethnic family organization. You can go into any precinct in this country, and the uncle's working there, the brother's working there, the father's working there, the daughter's working there, the son is working there, and they're almost all from the same white ethnic group that dominates that neighborhood. So police in America have become a white family business based on certain white ethnic groups, from the Polish to the Irish, with the Irish being the most dominant, to the Italian and so forth. Look at it and see if I'm lying. That, that policing has become a white family business for certain white ethnic groups. And these are the same white ethnic groups that was used to hold us in check to enslave. Right on. Right so on. reality will wake your butt up. Okay. <laughs> it, it definitely and, will. And, and, and Malcolm always said, know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Now people are scared of the truth because then they don't want to be free, you know? Amen. Yeah. So I, that makes you have some suspecting. And we just saw all of the stuff that came up about Clarence Thomas' wife and her connection to uh, Trump and all of that mess. So then we come back to the black elite in this country in terms of their alliance to black communities' interests versus the black elite group's interests in relationship to the kind of alliance they have with the white ruling power elite in America. And so that's when we get into the class caste and try to get an understanding of class caste struggle. But when you get in class caste struggle, don't lose the race because you'll lose the game. And that's mm -hmm. what the left had made us do over and over and over again. So we end up fighting the same bat decades and decades later starting from the same place, always getting us to go back and start all over again. We, we need to start where we have the generation before had advanced us, that we can see some victory down the road. I'm hoping that the young lady is able to, because the Supreme Court gives you a freedom. You don't have to worry about getting fired. So it gives you a freedom to be you if that's who you are. Um, and so I just, in this case, we just have to hope because we know there are some better black persons who would, could have been there. Right. And and she's extraordinary now. I'm not putting her down. The lady, the little bit I saw about her record, she's extraordinary, but we have even more extraordinary people. So, but they are criteria that white people use. Most of the Congress is white people, all right? And most of the Congress is racist white people. I don't care what party they belong to. And they have a criteria when picking black people. And that criteria always depend on how close they are socially and personally to white people. You know, it, it's funny. Okay. It's funny that um, in, in listening to you, uh, thinking back on the hearings, I remember one of the one of the questions that was posed around was around um i think lindsey graham had asked her about um if she had been to a dr jeffrey speech mm -hmm. i don't know if you caught that uh he's talking I about i just walked in the door with that yeah that. yeah 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 so i i thought that was interesting that you know and i, I know dr uh leonard jeffries is is one of your close comrades and We're very close he's like a father to me. yeah yeah my teacher for over 50 years Right on. You, it's funny. I actually met you two together about uh, probably about 20, 25 years ago in Harlem. I was actually coming out of a bodega and mm -hmm. you two were going in. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I was just like I, I was in fan mode. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> yeah, y'all was looking like I hope you get the hell out of my way so we can go ahead in this store. But, yeah. but, but well, Lenny has always been true to the to the people, Right on. you know, and the brother who PhD and all of the things that go on, he has never put that in front of serving the most common of our people. Right on. That's why I love him. And when they asked that question that day, you know, 
Um, I thought she handled it the best she could because they caught her off guard. If you remember, she was yeah, completely yeah. off guard about how yeah. to respond. I would have ate Graham the little white behind up, but <laughs> she didn't know how to go there. Right. Um, because when because she was at Harvard, I think when we went there, right, right, that was the one day I didn't go to the brother because the Harvard security called me at my office at City and said, Mr. Small, I'm head of the police at Harvard University, blah, 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 blah. We know you're coming up with Dr. Leonard Jeffries, and we really would like to ask you not to bring any guns on our campus. So like, why are you calling me? It's going to be not to bring guns on your campus, right? And they said, well, we will handle his security, blah, 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 blah. And I said, OK, sir. But well, we sent the team of the Sons of Africa with right Dr. Jeffries. And when they got to the school that day, the police was waiting and saying, Professor Jeffries, we're going to take you in through the back. And the brothers said, we don't do back doors. And so the Jewish young people were picketing out front. You know what we did? We just cut a line right through their picket line. Amen. That's how, that's how you and, do. And, and went inside. Right on. Not to do what he had to do. Right on. Um, and so there was nothing that he said that was racist or anti-Semitic in any of his speeches. And all the books and sources he was quoting, all of them were Jewish sources. Right. But he went after them. I said, right. Go after your own people. They wrote this stuff about you. Right. You know? right. But it wasn't about Leonard Jeffries. It was about destroying the black curricula called the curricula of inclusion. Mm -hmm. It was just about to be passed by the New York State um, Board of Regents to be taught in all of New York schools. Right. And, and Dr. Jeffries had written the African American portion. So they decided to go after Dr. Jeffries to destroy the curricular movement, and they were successful. And was this after uh, his uh, uh, great exchange with uh, uh, Koch? Con no, this is before. OK, okay. Yeah. so that, that, that kind of prompted all of that. Then. Yeah, that prompted that thing with Koch. Okay. But the, the real movement was we were trying to build on the our leadership of Sister Adelaide Stanford, who was the only black regents on the New York State Board. Right. And so right. that uh, Native American scholars was brought in to write the Native American history. Uh, Latino scholars was brought in to write the Latino history. Um, Asian scholars brought to write the Asian history and white European scholars to write theirs. Dr. Jeffries and his comments was brought in to write ours. Right. And that's when the shit hit the fan. Right. On. And they said, we are not going to have, that African history is just too big for them. So. <laughs> so they decided to destroy the whole curriculum movement right. by first relabeling it curricula of inclusion, mm. which was not the name. Yes, we were trying to be inclusive, but that was not the name of the project, you know. And, and who, who, who tried to uh, rewrite that? I mean, was it? I mean, because I'm sure. I mean, it, it couldn't have been white folks to just say that this is going to happen. I mean, they had no, a plot. This is just, this is um the movement was led by Sister Adelaide Sanford. Okay, right on, very right powerful, on. and she was on the board of regents. Right on. And we had the board in, the vote in the in assembly with the black votes in the assembly of the state of New York, and so she brought Dr. Jeffries in to write the African American portion. Of right on. And right that's on. when they went crazy, and right so on. they went after Dr. Jeffries. I've never seen nothing like it in the history of America. Yeah, I, I I remember hardcore, and you know, shout out to Dr. Jeffries. We actually had him on here uh, in January, right before his birthday. You mm -hmm. know, and he and he's still, uh, you know, still still kicking it hard, like oh, yeah. like like yeah. he's still on the block. You know, so definitely we appreciate both of your works. Um, yes. You know, we we we're wrapping up, but is there any uh, words you can give um, give the troops? You know, I would say like, what would be the marching orders if you had? Uh, opportunity to speak to um i would say the youth today because of the fact mm -hmm. that we know that it's elders for council and youth for war what right. would be be some uh some some words of uh advice or wisdom that you can impart learn that all politics is local and take control of your local political apparatus no doubt study your history know your history and know your culture so nobody can ever say you don't have a culture the only culture in america that's worth anything is the african culture um, practice Pan-Africanism. So read the Pan-African scholars. Learn Pan-African. Pan simply means to unite. We want to unite with our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean, Central South America, 
the continent of Africa and those that have scattered across Europe. We're nearly, when we come together as one, we're nearly three billion people, okay? In that unity, let's take control of freeing Africa and creating the Africa that we want to see instead of allowing our enemies to keep stealing the wealth of Africa away and impoverishing our people. There's no need for one African to be in poverty, not one. And last year, we spent almost $2 trillion in America. There's no need for one African-American to be impoverished if you're spending $2 trillion, except we're spending it foolishly. So I'll close with this. Learn that we have well, our primary motivation is to provide the food, clothing, shelter, safety, and security for ourselves. To do that, we must can take control of the economic politics and culture where we live. And that means you can't put your money with your enemy and expect it to come back to you. And fourth, we get control of land, labor, and resources. So we can determine who works and who don't work in our community. And let's stop praising gangs that don't know the difference between their families and race and the enemy's families and race. And what I mean by that, you say you're a gang, study the history of gangs and other ethnic groups. Those gangs and the Polish, the Italians, the, the Jews, they protected their people. And they fought against the enemies of their people. They did not kill their women and children in the street by the thousands. They did not rob the poorest of their people or sell the poor people drugs and say, well, I, I didn't tell them to buy it. You know, Malcolm would say, you need to lose your head hmm. for statements like that. I know. Learn to love your people, respect your people, respect yourself, love your ancestors, study them, and they will guide you well. You know, that would be my message. Hey, man, listen here, man. Um, Professor Small, I didn't even know you was a rapper. You know what I'm saying? You uh, <laughs> you came with the lyrics, you know. So, uh, we 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 go we gonna attribute that to your uh, to 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 your New York side of things, huh? You yes, know I mean? sir. well, you know, I'm a New Yorker, and yeah. I know a lot of those young fellas. I, you know, people don't understand that we're all a family, even when we don't realize it. You know what I'm saying? That's right. That's right. And we're closer than we think we are. So, struggle to learn how close we are. Study your history. Erase the white mystery. Okay. And work your black magic. Study your history, erase the white man's mystery, and then you can do your black magic. No doubt. Change the world. Well, we and definitely uh, we definitely look forward to uh, bringing you back on again and again and again. We appreciate you uh, dropping jewels over here today at Riot Starter TV. And, um, you know, whenever you got anything to talk about, and, and you feel like, look, I got to get this out. We on deck. Just hit me up and we ready to roll. How about that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, my brother. Peace and blessings to the whole family there. Yes, sir, brother. And Thank you. like you said, I'm here for you, too. Yes, sir. And there's a word in the Yoruba, because, you know, I love my Yoruba priestess position. But Yoruba is a people, not a religion. Let's get that straight. There's an African sacred science that we falsely call religion, but it's just the science of the universe and ecology. And we need to work that out as we create our new ideology of communal, collective, cooperative behavior, making Pan-Africanism work for us. Right on, right on. And, and that, that word is what? What's that word we talk about? It's, it's Lukomi. In okay. Cuba, in Cuba, that's, they call that the African traditional religion, Lukomi. It means you belong to me and I belong to you. Right on. I right will on. die for you and I expect you to die for me. Right on. Right so on. Look on me. You're mine. Yes, I'm yours. Yes, sir. Look at me, brother. So we will talk to you uh, soon. Stay yes, on sir. point. Stay ready yes. for revolution. And we will see in the whirlwind as, uh, Absolutely. as, as, as the brother was saying. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are the whirlwind that he talked about. Without a doubt. Without a All doubt. Right. Those cubs he left in the bush. Yes, right on. Peace yes, and blessings. Peace and blessings to you. You've been checking out Riot Starter TV. That was Professor James Smalls. If you're not familiar with Dr. Smalls, make sure you go check him out. Uh, Digging the crates. Uh, we have, um, we just celebrated 
uh, one year anniversary of Riot Starter TV a few days ago. And um, there are a number of different things that we're going to be introducing to the platform, to Black Power Media. Make sure you check out Black Power Media. Check out some of our archives. I know that uh, uh, our guy, Dr. Jared Ball, just did something on Dr. King this morning. So make sure you go back and check out what he has to offer. Um, also, tomorrow we have, uh, we're back again with uh, the Remix Morning Show from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Eastern. If it's your first time coming on board, make sure you like and subscribe what it is we're doing here at Black Power Media. Um, yes. And also, I have a, a channel, um, Kalanji Changa Riot Starter. I'm going to have a few exclusive things coming through there as well. So make sure you check me out over there, Kalanji Changa the Riot Starter, and um, support our platform, uh, blackpowermedia.org. You can check out, like I said, archives. We have merchandise and all that type of stuff. And if you feel it in your heart, become a patron by joining our Patreon on that same platform. Anyway, you've been checking out Riot Starter TV make sure you share this broadcast and this platform we have a whole bunch of dope guests lined up i got some folks that's really gonna um then i then i don't even know if i should bring on here because i'm not sure that folks are quite ready but um you know we have some real heavy hitters lined up and i'm looking forward to sharing um good people that we know with you and um and, and your people so stay on board Stay on the right side of the barricades. Stay ready for revolution. And um, until next time, I see you tomorrow, 8 a.m. EST, Riot Starter TV.